Hello and good morning to everybody. This is John Mullins from Themis and welcome to today's webinar. I, I thought I'd put together a webinar on a topic that uh, it's a little bit different than what we've done in the past. So t if you're familiar with our webinars, you've seen uh, sessions on DB2, on Java, on Oracle. Uh, we really haven't seen anything on the, the Linux and Unix side at the operating system level. So I thought I'd go there today with kind of a, just a simple look at grep, the grep and sed commands. So that's what we'll be doing uh, today. And you notice here on the screen, just to kind of get started here, um, again, my name is John Mullins. Um, you can see my email address there, jmullins at themasync.com. Um, you can also see our website there, themasync.com. If you go to that website, there's a, a link at the top of the page there for webinars, and that includes past webinars as well. So if you're new to our joining our webinars, feel free to go to that page, and there are dozens of uh, webinars out there from the past, uh, both the slides of the webinars or the recorded presentations as well. And most of these webinars will last anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Themis Training. So a few places you can get a hold of us if, if, you, if you need to. All right, as we go through the um, webinar, if you do have any questions with our short time frame they have, best way, way, way to, to get a question in there is just send me a, an email to my, you can see it again on this page again, jmullins at themasync.com, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. That'll be the, the best way, so that ensures we get through all the material and the time frame we have, and then if there's any questions afterwards, I can get back to you. i got all kinds of time to do that. I look, at, look and read email all the time there. So I know I recognize some of the names there, so it's good to see you back at the one of our webinars. If you're new to your webinar or new to one of my webinars or trainings, here's a little bit of information about myself. Um, I started back in the early 1980s working for Boeing for 10 years as a developer, programmer, DBA type person on a number of different operating systems, including Unix at that time, and then Linux uh, since then. So I've been working with a long time, uh, working in those environments with relational databases, Oracle mostly, but DB2, SQL Server, and a few others as well, and Java. So I've been doing it for a long time and I've taught a DOF classes, so welcome back if you have been in one of my classes before. You also then know a little bit about Themis as a company. They've been around for a long time, teach all kinds of different classes out there. So data, relational database related, operating system, programming languages, you name it. And again, there's your, your uh, links or web pages that you can go to to get more information about that and see some of the schedules that are out there. And I'll have some information at the end of the webinar so that you, can, if you want to get, contact somebody about the class. What, one, one of the nice things about some of the classes that we have are, you know, we teach classes just like everybody else as far as, okay, here's the material, here's the outline, here's what we're going to teach. But we also have the uh, flexibility and capability to customize our classes. So if you look at an outline and there's a certain area of this, that, that's not what we're doing and you're looking at maybe a private class or such, we can look at customizing that for you as well. And here's some of those classes that are at least related to some of the stuff that we're doing today. So we do have an introduction to Linux and Unix class, of, and then we also have a, a shell programming class for both those environments as also. And you can see those out at our website. But what we here? What are we here for today? So we're going to look at the grep and sed commands. And when I'm basically, if, if you're not familiar with them at all, I'm going to describe what they do, and then I'm just going to show you some examples, and that'll take us through our webinar today. So what I've done is I've thrown together, you know, an, a handful of examples of each, just to kind of showing you what some of their capabilities are, what some of their options are. Um, so if you're not familiar with them at all. This gives you a starting point to go back and do a little bit more research on those. It, you know if you're in the Linux and Unix environments, you can always request online help in those environments, either by doing a man command, M-A-N, or you could do the command followed by a dash dash help, 
and get information about it. And then there's another a number of other ways to do that as well. Well, those are the two most common ways. So you can certainly get more information about the options um, and some of their capabilities, examples by issuing those two help type of commands that are out there. So let's take a look at grep first. Um, first off, <laughs> if you go out there and look, and you may have a different uh, meaning for what grep stands for, but um, it's, uh, there are a number of different interpretations for what GREP stands for, actually. So on here on this slide, we're saying it stands for globally search for regular expression and print it out. Um, you'll see other meanings for that acronym um, out on the internet as well. So just be aware of that. Um, there's not one right or wrong way to describe what it stands for, just so you know. GREP is used to look for particular patterns of characters inside files okay we have other commands for looking for files themselves but we, we want to look for a pattern of characters inside of files and, and we often do that with uh, regular expressions which are very common to you know most programming languages support regular expressions and we'll talk more about regular expressions here in just a bit but regular expressions have all these special characters that have special meanings there's wild cards there and you'll see i've uh, have uh, included in these slides a, a handful of what some of those regular expressions are. They can be a little bit confusing. I think that's maybe the most confusing part is just the regular expressions and their special characters, their special combinations of characters and what they mean because a lot of the characters used in regular expressions are also used in other utilities and tools in operating at the operating system level as well, but they may have a different meaning. You know, one of them is an asterisk, for example. You know, there's a, I have an example in, the, in these slides of an asterisk. We're used to an asterisk, you know, meaning some sort of a wild card, um, usually meaning zero or more characters as a wild card, where with regular expressions, it's kind of like that, but it's zero or more of what I'm looking for is zero or more of what, whatever the preceding character is right before the asterisk which is totally different than just a regular asterisk, say, looking for files or such. If I went out and did a, you know, a, an L, if I'm in a Unix or Linux environment and I do a uh, ls minus L, for example, with an asterisk, meaning all files out on the system. Yeah. Uh, so I could do that, but with the regular expression, it means something totally different. You'll see that when it comes up here on the slide in a few moments. So grep is we're looking for patterns inside of files, and it could be one file, it could be multiple files that we have out there. Right, this is just a little more on regular expressions as far as what they are. There's just a string of special characters that have special meanings um, to allow us to look for um, patterns that were in, inside files. Uh, here's some of those special characters here. So if you've done, if you're already familiar with a Linux and Unix environment and regular expressions, you know what these are. But let's go through them for those that uh, this is fairly new for. So we know we can have the caret. You can see up here on this first bullet, we can have a caret or a dollar sign there. Those are called anchor characters. You know, the caret represents, now this all makes a big difference on where you have the caret too with regular expressions, which I think you really have to get into regular expressions to you know, not get kind of confused about, well, wait a minute, I thought a caret meant not. Well, it does, but that, it only means not if it's, you know, used a certain way, whether it's inside a square bracket or outside a square bracket, kind of, you know, depends on a lot of where it's actually used as to what its meaning might be. Um, but typically you'll see the caret is the, the start of a line. So whatever I'm looking for, I'm looking at the start of a line or at the end of the line, or I can use both in the same context there. So the dollar sign being the end of a line there. The second bullet there looks maybe a little bit hard to read, but there's a dot there, a dot dash. So the dot or the period, uh, a wildcard character to match to any single character all right. Now, if we're looking for th strings that contain dots, then we may have to incorporate the last special character there, which is the escape character, which turns off the special meaning of the character that follows it. And I'll, I'll have an example of that one, too, because all, all of these are pretty common. Um, I'm not going to go through in the time frame we have 
all the special characters that are, that are part of regular expressions, but some of the more common ones will do that. So until we get into the examples here, um, we'll go through a couple more here and then we'll get into those examples. So there's those square brackets. Right. Use to specify a range of characters to be matched. Now, one thing to remember about square brackets is within a single set of square brackets, that represents a single character, not a group of characters. Okay. So you'll see that in an example when it comes up here in just a few moments. So even though you look in the square brackets, you might see something like um, you know, zero dash nine. That doesn't mean I can have an unlimited number of digits that I'm trying to match to. That just means within that single character, it's gonna be a zero through a nine. So it's one number, one digit, a zero, a one, a two, up to nine, but it can't be multiple. If I'm gonna have multiple, I'm gonna to have to combine square brackets. Um, so I have a square bracket example in here too. And then there's that asterisk again. No, notice the definition there. And that's the part that sometimes we um, forget because we're used to using asterisks in other ways, but matches zero or more of the preceding pattern. That could be a, a single letter. Um, I have an example in here. It could be a wild card character, which means zero or more letters or numbers or characters or whatever you want to call it there. So there we have some special characters uh, that can be very useful in using this grep command. Look, remember, we're looking for strings within inside of files here. All right, here's the syntax. I won't spend too much time on that, but just grep some options. So usually our options start with a dash, dash I, dash N. You'll see a few of those here. What pattern are we looking for? and what file are we looking for that pattern in? And again, that file can be a wildcard, it can be an asterisk, it could be a subdirectory, um, whatever there. All right, so let's take a look at um, first some options. I won't go through these too uh, in too much detail because I'm gonna list out some of these as we look at the examples coming up in a couple of pages here. But you know, we can get the number of lines that match the pattern, like a dash C. Um, here's an important one. How about a dash I to ignore case sens uh, sensitivity? Those will be, those are both pretty good there. Um, we may wanna display uh, the line numbers as they're being matched. So that if I have to go into the file, I have some idea where to go into the file for. And then here's a few more here on the next page as well. And there's more options than this. Again, go to the man command or the dash dash help option for say grep. And uh, that'll give you more information on that. Remember as we go through here, if you have any questions, just send them off to jmullins at themasync.com. I'll get back to you. Let's jump right into some examples. These are the best things to look at right here. So each bullet, sub bullet here will represent a different example. I started off very simple, and most of these aren't too complex. Just wanted to kind of build upon those. Maybe we'll have another webinar on more complex use of, of the grep command, but here's some examples in here. So I have grep in the single quotes. Now, the pattern you're looking for here, oftentimes the single quotes versus double quotes versus no quotes, depending on what you have in the pattern you're looking for, you may not need any of any of those. You can, they're interchangeable depending on what you're looking for there. So I, some cases you don't need quotes at all. Some cases you do need quotes, some single, some double, but it also can depend on which shell you might be in as well. Um, you just kind of, you all just kind of develop a standard there. I typically will put quotes around it. Um, here we're, so we're here, we're looking for the string ORA, uppercase ORA dash in all files in the current directory that end with a dot log as their extension. So the asterisk you see there, the asterisk there means any file name at all. Not, it doesn't mean have anything to do with um, zero or more of the preceding character string. Um, so there it's a wild card at the OS level. So looking for that. And I have some comments out here to the right following these pound signs too. So the second one looks just like the first one, except I have the dash I on it. And that's the case insensitive search. Right, in case we have some ORAs in there that are lowercase or mixed case or whatever. All right. The, the next one has a good example of that caret. 
remember I mentioned that some of these characters, depending on where you're using them, can have multiple meanings. And I think that makes it probably most confusing to most people is that, oh, I thought the carrot meant this, but now you're telling me it means that. Well, it depends on where you're using it. Here, the carrot is not inside square brackets. It's part of the, the string there. So remember the carrot, if it's not inside the square brackets there, um, or used some other way, just means at the start of the line. So here we're looking for ORA dash at the start of a line in some dot log file. All right, so if the ORA dash is not at the start of the line, but it's in the middle of the line somewhere, at the end of the line, somewhere other than the start, which start means right there in position one, um, it's not going to match unless it's at the start of the line. Okay. The next one down there, and I'll just go through these one by one. I said if you have some questions on these, just jot them down and send them to me. Um, the second one, I use the dash in, so it will show the matching line numbers. Same search as I had on the previous bullet, looking for ORA dash at the start of a line, um, but I want to know which line it's on as well. So that if I, it shows me the file name that it's in, and it shows me the matching line, I'd like to know what line it is, so that if I want to look in that particular file later, I can bring it up in my editor, go straight to that line. You know, if you're using VI, you can use an uppercase G along with a number to go straight to that line and then look at it directly there. So that might be helpful for what we want to do. And then, of course, some of you or all of you may know that you can combine Unix and Linux type of commands into kind of a single command string, as you see in this last bullet down here, by using this single pipe. So we have the results of one command feeding the results of another command. You can have really as many of these as you want here. This last one is doing, what's it doing here? We're doing a PS minus EF. So we're doing a show process command, getting the full details of all the processes that are running out there on the operating system. It's gonna take that output and pass it to the next command. We just have to make sure that the second command can accept some output or input, I should say. Um, so there we're doing a grep oracle. Notice there's no file name that follows that, like we've seen in the previous examples. So here we're saying grep oracle. Well, where are we looking? So we're looking for the string oracle in lower case here. Where are we looking for it? We're looking for it in the output from the previous command, which is the PS command. I use that all the time, especially if I'm working as a, a DBA for Oracle. Um, in that type of environment, I want to see which processes are running or if I'm trying to troubleshoot or debug a particular process that might be consuming a lot of resources on the system. You could do that for non-database type processes too, as long as you know what to look for there. In this case, I'm looking for the word Oracle because that shows up in a show process command for Oracle type of processes. So a very handy type command, that pipe, if you haven't used it before, um, can be very handy uh, to combine commands. Otherwise, I mean, it, otherwise you could you can run these one by one yourself, but if you've done that, you know that that's not very useful and can take up certainly more time there. And all these things that we're talking about here on this page and the pages to follow too, these are all in our introduction to Linux and Unix type classes too, and our shell programming classes. These all show up in there, so if you want to get more information on those, you can see about registering for that. Here's some more. Um, what if I just want a list of the file names that contain this string? Now, how many times have we done that? I know, maybe it's just me, I don't know, <laughs> where I've, I've got a whole bunch of files on the system, and we're, we're usually pretty good about naming our files, right? We give them good, meaningful names of our files so that we know what the contents kind of reflect. But, you know, oh, I, I go back to somebody and I say, oh, I got a good example of that type of command. Um, which file did I put that in? You know, if I know what the command is that I'm looking for, I can use the correct grep command to go against the files in my directory looking for that particular command that I have an example of so I can show to somebody else. Rather than, otherwise, what, what do I do? Oh, I open up this file, I'm looking through it, or do a search through it. Uh, oh, it's not in there, I go to the next file. Uh, that's gonna take me all day. Hopefully I find it right away. Well, hopefully I'm lucky, right? But if I'm not, that's gonna take a while. So, you know, grep is, it's it showing me the file names that contain a certain string. That could be very helpful too. 
All right, how about the second one here? This is kind of a, a variation of the one I just showed you a little bit ago with that carrot, where we're looking at the start of the line, but here I've also in, uh, encased the word or string error with a dollar sign on the end of the line, and we're looking at a file called alert.log. So this is only gonna match lines that contain just that one word. So it's, it's anchored on the left by, by the start of the line, it's anchored on the right by the end of the line, and there's nothing in between other than the word error is what I'm looking for. Okay, so you can use combinations of these special characters um, to help you look for your string matches here. And then the last one, maybe this is helpful if you're trying to clean up some files and such, and you can use this with a combination of maybe the sed command, which we're gonna talk about next, is this one's looking for blank lines. So notice what I'm grepping right after it. I have a caret followed directly by a dollar sign with nothing in between in the alert.log file. So I'm looking for all lines that really don't have anything on them. I mean, it looks like all blanks essentially there, but there's no other characters there for us to take a look at. So that might be helpful. And like I said, we could combine that with uh, the sed command or other commands depending on what we want to do because one of the things we could do with the set command is delete lines. So maybe I want to go in and delete all the blank lines because I don't want them um, to go into my next step of my processing, which, which might um, not, not run properly with the blank lines in it. All right, a few more here, and then we'll move on to the set command. Um, here's some with square brackets. I want to throw some of those in for you. Just to remember the purpose of the webinar is to kind of show you some of the capabilities of grep and sed if you haven't seen them before, or maybe show you some options that you haven't used before. So remember that square brackets, I kind of em emphasized this earlier in the webinar, they represent a single character. So even though here I have a, a lowercase o and an uppercase o, I have them in a square bracket. So that's kind of like an or. So I'm looking for something here um, a string that starts either with a lowercase or an uppercase O followed by the string R-A-C-L-E. And I'm looking for that in the alert.log file. So it'll match to both Oracle in lowercase and Oracle in uppercase, at least as far as the first character goes there. Okay, that one's not too bad. The second one gets a little bit confusing, I think. Uh, we have those square brackets again. Look at that, it has an uppercase A-Z and a lowercase A-Z, all within square brackets. Okay, notice there's no comma between those two sets of A-Z and A-Z there. So, and it's a square bracket, so what are we looking for there? It's a single character. What, what is that single character we're trying to match to? It's either an uppercase letter or a lowercase letter. And what is that uppercase or lowercase letter followed by? One zero zero. Okay, and you can you can have um, if you go out and you can Google this or whatever, but you can have multiple characters too. Like you could have one square bracket for this, like you see here, a dash z, a dash z, and then a second square bracket that follows it that might be zero dash nine. Okay, so you're looking for something that starts with a letter followed by a number maybe followed by something else. Okay, so you can have as many of these square brackets as you want. Just remember that each square bracket represents one single character. All right, how about the third one here? Um, this one has an escape character in it, so it also has the caret in it. So, so the caret is not in square brackets, so the caret's representing the starting of a line. Uh, what are we looking for here? We're matching, we wanna see any lines that start with a dot or a period followed by a digit, a single digit. So dot something, point one, point nine, point zero. Not point, we're not looking for point, you know, zero, one, two, three. We're looking for just the first two characters of the line have to be a dot and a number. That's what we're looking for there. Now, the dot, notice right before it, it has this escape character, this kind of backslash character there. So what that's doing is that's stripping the dot of its special meaning. So a dot is kind of like an asterisk in some cases where a dot means uh, zero or more whatever. It's a wild card, but it's only for one position 
Um, so we can't say zero more, that's the asterisk, right? The dot is one and only one. And then I don't care what it is. It could be um, a, a letter, it could be a number, it could be anything. So dot is a wild card for a single character. It's kind of like if you're used to SQL and you use the, in your where clause, you have like a, a like operator and you say where um, last name like, and then you have something like uh, M underscore L and so on. The underscore in SQL with the like operator, that's a wildcard character for one character, right? Whereas an asterisk is multiple characters. Same thing here, but instead of an underscore, they use a dot. All right, so those are just some examples of using the, the grep. So one of the things you might take away from today's webinar, like I said, at, at some point, I don't know if they're out there just yet, but if you go out to our website, themasync.com, and go to webinars, the slides will be out there available for you to download. So one thing you might take away from this webinar is you just get some various examples of using the grep command. I know you can look them up yourself, but this will make it a little bit easier so you don't have to bounce all over the place. You know, which websites are better than other websites? Some of the websites have errors on them. Um, so uh, this kind of gives you just a one place to go to get some good examples there. All right, and then we got one more set of, I'm gonna jump back to here, of greps here. And these are a little bit different in, the, in this case here. So let's take a look at these real quick and then we'll jump on to said. Um, how about this first one? Um, we have this uh, E, here's those dots again, dot, 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 R. Okay, get a list of, of all five character strings, they say words, but I'll say strings, starting with an E and ending in an R. They have to be five, why? Because of the three dots. So we have E, some character, some character, some character, and then an R. Okay, it has to be five. If it's E with four characters before the R, that doesn't match. Okay, now the next one is that funky one that I was talking about with that asterisk because we're used to an asterisk mean, just meaning zero or more of anything, but that's not what we're getting here. Here we have what? C dot asterisk H. Oh my gosh. That looks a little bit confusing, I think. And we're looking in alert.log for this. So what's this gonna do? It's gonna match all words that start with a C and end in an H, and it could have as many letters between them as uh, whatever to match. Because what happens in this case? Well, the dot, what does the dot represent? A wild card for a single character position. And then what does the asterisk represent? Zero or more of the preceding character. So here we're looking for C followed by a wild card. Um, how many of those wild cards? Zero or more of those wild cards or whatever that letter is, H. What if that wasn't a dot? What if it was CR asterisk H? That means I'm looking for what? All strings or words that are C followed by zero or more R's followed by an H. So it'd be CRH would match, CRRRH would match, right? But CRAH would not match, okay? So it, we can do all kinds of things. Regular expressions are very powerful. Um, with the number of special characters they have, we can do all kinds of things. And the last one's very simple. It uses the, the what we're highlighting here is the dash C. I just wanna know how many lines match the string. You know, if I'm looking for a certain error message or certain types of error messages or all my error messages are preceded by something, like for example, Oracle error messages often start with an ORA dash followed by some number. I just wanna know how many errors are in this file because maybe this is a log file from a batch job or something like that. I just want to know how many there are. I mean, and I could use this in what? My shell scripting. I could get what? Take the number that's that's passed back here and assign it to a variable and then do an if statement or a case statement on the variable saying, well, if the if the number is greater than zero, then do this. If it's zero, then that means successful and and then proceed as appropriate. So I can get, just get the number rather than show me all the matches. Because what, what if potentially I have um, a lot of errors? 
This is a multi-step process. Each step does a lot of different things. You know, it is possible if something was really bad, like maybe I'm um, violating a constraint condition in a database and there's a, a, a simple but very powerful error in there. Maybe there are thousands of them. I don't want to see thousands of them necessarily from the start. I just want to see um, how many there are. And then from there, maybe I want to see the details. So if the number is greater than one, zero, for example, then another step might say, do a grep again, but show me the details. And that would be cool. You could do something like that. All right, let's look at the set here real quick. I know you're been all out there very busy, so we'll go through here. So grep looks for different types of strings with different types of regular expressions you can use as wildcards and such um, to look for strings inside of files. Well, what if I want to change, do like a global change through multiple files, for example? I can use the sed command for that. So sed is what's called a stream editor. It can do things like I can look for stuff. If I find stuff, replace it. Um, I can add lines. I can delete lines based on matches or no matches in that case there. So again, this will use um, regular expressions with pattern matching as well. So grep, I'm, I'm looking for the stuff. With sed, typically I'm replacing something. I want to do a global replace. And I'll have some examples of that here coming up here too. Here's its syntax, kind of like grep. We have some options we can put on it with like a dash. Uh, and we can look at one or more files. So let's let's just jump right into this one and look at some examples. So here I have said um, lots of different, some of the options I can do, some of the different uh, things I can do, like an uh, S here is for substitution. So inside single quotes here, I'm saying substitute. Uh, if I match to VOID in uppercase, <clears throat> I want to replace it with VOID in lowercase. In a, in a file called program.java. So this is doing a substitution there. And again, you could do that with <clears throat> across multiple files as well. So instead of program.java here, I could, ast have, could have asterisk.java or just an asterisk or whatever, just saying, hey, maybe there was an error in one of our application programs and it kept spitting out these different mes messages into these different reports or into these different log files. And rather than you know, right away anyway, fixing the program and ha having to rerun it, because maybe it takes two hours to rerun the program to get the right results. For now, I'll fix the program, sure, for the next time it runs, but maybe I just want to go out there and change these files before they're printed, before they're emailed to somebody, or whatever there. Now, when I do, like we did up here in this first bullet, we're, we're substituting uppercase void with lowercase void. That will go through each of the files that I have it told it to go through, like program.java, it's just one file. If it finds the uppercase void, the way the first bullet's written here, it's only going to change the first occurrence of it on each line. So if all 10 lines have it um, just one time, it'll change all 10 lines. But what if a line has the word void more than once on it? It's only In this syntax on the first bullet, it's only going to change the first occurrence. If you go to the second bullet, which is exactly like the first one, except it has a slash G on it, that's going to replace, again, uppercase void with lowercase void for every occurrence on every line. So if lines have two or three or four occurrences of that uppercase void, it'll change all four. So that slash G for global is what it stands for. Do a global search and replace of uppercase void replacing it with lowercase void. Okay, so that can be very important, right? So uh, you have to kind of think, is it possible that, that the, line, the strings I'm looking for could occur in, in uh, more than one place on the same line? So should I just do a slash G to make sure I get all of them? Or, or maybe I only want to change the first occurrence. It's up to you. And then the third one has some regular expressions in here. Right? This is kind of a nice little one here, too. It has the slash G on the end as well. Um, what are we looking for here? What are we substituting? So we're looking for strings that start with either a low, uppercase Z or lowercase Z, 
followed by IP, so zip, in other words, either with an upper or lower case C. We're looking for that on each line, uh, and we're looking for the multiple occurrences on each line. If, so any occurrence we find with that match, we're going to change it to JAR, J-A-R, so Java archive file. Okay, so remember the, the square brackets represent just a single character there. All right, here's a few more. And this one has a lot of description with it. Said dash n, so now here's where emphasizing or highlighting the dash n in this case here. We're still um, substituting void for void, lowercase for uppercase here. So, uh, and then the slash p, uh, um, a lot of times you don't need the slash p, it stands for print, which by default most of the options will print the outcome of the change there, but if not all of them will, just to kind of warn you there. So we could put the dash P on it to print um, the replace lines, whichever lines have a match on them. Um, some of the lines might be exactly the same as some of the other lines. You know, if I had something that was repeating in here and the lines were exactly the same, the dash N will suppress those duplicate printouts for you. So if you're printing out all your matches and you have a bunch of matches, like maybe the same error message shows up 50 times. And I really don't care for what I'm doing right now to see all 50. I just want to know what distinct, unique error messages I'm getting. Uh, the dash N would be very helpful for that. And then the last one here, this dash D or slash D, is, this is for deleting. So I'm looking through a file called alert.log. And if I find the string in uppercase error, the word error, E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, I'm going to delete that line, the entire line. So maybe there's certain things in a, in a file that I want to get rid of before that file is passed to the next step in a multi-step process. Maybe I want to get rid of blank lines and delete them. You know, find them and delete them. Um, or maybe I'm looking for certain lines. Maybe there was some like a syntax or formatting type of lines in there like dashes or asterisks to separate one section from another. And I just want I don't want the special formatting in there. I could delete those out as well. So there's a few other ones that you can do there with the sed command there. So remember, sed is the stream editor. It's trying to find something. And when it finds something, it's going to do what? Either substitute, so do a replace. You can delete based upon it. All right, here's a couple more. Let's see what we got here. We got one set more here. So we're hitting the end here. So. Um, this first one's a, a good one too. This first bullet here has a sub bullet, so it's just one example here. But you can also, if you want to, and I guess this would be all right in some cases, um, you can combine multiple strings that you're searching for on a, in a single set command. You don't always have to do them separate. And you do that by separating it up here on this line you see with a semicolon. So here we got said dash I. Um, the dash I means a case insensitive type of search. So I'm looking for, I'm going to substitute, whenever I find the word January or string January, I'm going to substitute it with February and I'm doing a global replace. You can also have a dot, an I following the G, which means case insensitive as well. So some of these things you can use in different places and they have the same meaning here. So I'm looking, um, in this file here, what called report.txt. I'm, for each line, I'm looking for January, and if I find it in whatever case, I'm replacing it with February. But also, I'm doing it at the same time, is I'm going to do a substitution on each line in that report.txt text file. If I find the string 2018, I'm going to replace it with 2019, case insensitive, which doesn't really matter with the numbers there, but I'm doing a global search and replace there, so getting multiple occurrences on the same line also. That's kind of cool. You can combine them that way. <clears throat> I think that makes actually our code a little bit simpler than trying to break it up into doing one thing at a time after one. So in this case, I'm only making one pass. Whereas if I separated these out, I'd have to do multiple passes, which would be less efficient. Okay, so there's some examples of using the sed command. Some of those maybe you've used before. So maybe some of those were new to you. So to kind of wrap things up, we kind of just wanted to go through and just kind of see a <clears throat> introduction to the grep and sed commands. These are very common 
Uh, people use these a lot. They have a lot of options. We only touched the, the, the tip today of what they can do as far as the number of options go and how to use those. And we know that grep, because we're looking for patterns inside of files, uh, and said we're looking for patterns inside of files, but then we're going to do something with it. Like the main thing is we do a substitution or a replace. Okay. Again, these slides will be available out on our website, themasync.com. Um, they might already be out there. If they're not, just come back a little bit later. Make a note to yourself to check again a little bit later. And again, if you have any questions regarding grep or sed or anything else that has to do with Linux or Unix or databases or Java or whatever, feel free to send me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If it's something that's outside my range of expertise, I'll find somebody that can uh, hopefully address your question for you for sure. All right, here's the page on more information. Go out to our website, themasync.com. If you do want to talk about classes and on customizing those or registration for those, you can contact John Cacaval. Many of you have already done that in the past, so jcac at themasync.com. Um, you can, again, go out to our website to get the slides and the recording. The slides will be out there before the recording, so the recording takes a, a little bit of uh, time to process. Uh, other than that, we also have another webinar coming up. Make a note of this if you're an SQL type person. Uh, June 19th, it's a Wednesday, um, we have a webinar titled Advanced Aggregate Functions in SQL. And that'll be a good one. It, again, it'll start at 11.30 Eastern time. Um, you can go out to, it's out there right now. Um, I don't know if they've sent out invitations to it yet or not. All right, I appreciate you uh, taking time out of your busy day today. Thank you for attending. Hopefully these will, little bit of information about grep and set will be helpful to you or reinforce some of the other things that you, you already knew about those or prompt you to go out and learn a little bit more about those um, as you have time as well. So thank you again. Have a good day and hope to see you soon in another webinar or a future class uh, uh, sponsored by Themis. Talk to you soon.